let's wait for the slides. Great. Um, it's great to be here. Okay. So unlike the previous speaker, I'm an amateur to this topic. At the University of Michigan, I worked on integrated circuits. At Google, I work on search uh, during the day, and at night, I worry about dystopian threats to humanity. <laughs> if you follow the media on this topic, there is a large number of opinions. Uh, prominent thinkers uh, have very strong opinions. For example, uh, Stephen Hawking thinks that the human race cannot compete and will be superseded. Um, others have equally strong opinions, but Andrew Ng, when he was still at Baidu last year, he compared worrying about AI or malicious AI today is like worrying about the overpopulation of Mars. That was last year. A lot of things have changed since last year. Andrew is not at Baidu anymore. I don't know if he still has this opinion, but we can think of this as an issue of time scale. At the long, at the far time scale, the dystopian threats are definitely an issue. That seems very realistic. At the short time scale, probably not. At the medium time scale, we need to look at specific predictions. So let's do this. Let's look at predictions that were set forward by Ray Kurzweil, who is at Google. And of, I think, 25 of his predictions, uh, these five look particularly relevant and somewhat striking. So he claims that in 10 years or so, virtual reality will be almost indistinguishable from the reality. Then computers will surpass humans. This is probably in the short term or maybe the medium term, we are worrying about things like this. Uh, humans are going to become machines through augmentation and eventually the earth will be made of computers, right? So we are going to discuss what can happen if these predictions come true and what can we do to prevent disasters. Now, you might counter that Kurzweil's predictions are gratuitous. He doesn't necessarily look at economics. He doesn't give a lot of numbers. But just a couple of days ago, oops. Yes. Uh, if you take self-driving cars, which is you know something that's happening, we don't know exactly when, um, but Intel puts a huge figure on the industry related to self-driving cars. This is happening. These are economic, economy-related reasons, and we have to account for this in our discussions and predictions, right? If if the malicious AI uh, things will take over the world, going through self-driving cars would be an easy way, right? And if you look at News related to biology, this is pretty staggering. It's the first trial of the CRISPR technique, which is gene editing. The first trial that is non-invasive. Basically, uh, through some gel, cells are not taken from the human body, but the uh, genes are gonna be edited and modified to prevent some diseases. And there are 20 plus trials set for this year and next year along these lines. So it's, I don't know if you track all of these developments, it's difficult to be an expert in all of these things, so we have to somehow foresee what will happen and what we can do about this, even if we don't understand all the details, right? This is where uh, we rely on very general, very high-level predictions. Okay. Obviously, the world is changing faster than we can keep up, and the new technologies, both computer technologies and biotechnologies, affect how we live and how we die. In particular, the statistics of death change based on what can be cured and what cannot be cured, right? Now, the um, influence of technology, of technology on uh, what we are afraid of is something that's well covered by the media, and uh, it's, it's pretty obvious that there's a compulsory Terminator slide or picture and there's a hell picture, but these are great illustrations of what we are afraid of. We are afraid of um, some kind of intelligence, perhaps artificial, that exceeds us in some ways, wants to kill us, and what we have to do, we have to find some way out. Right, this is a premise behind many of these stories, but if you go a little further back, you will see that there are other kinds of intelligence, not necessarily artificial, that we, are, we were afraid of. 
Um, there are some living creatures, where the werewolves, the kraken, uh, the Godzilla, maybe the bogeyman that wanted to kill us. So why are we, as, as um, you know, the humanity, why are we obsessed with these things? So I claim this is very natural. This is just plain evolution. Um, we are obsessed with survival, and if we weren't, we wouldn't have survived through the history, right? Um, going to prehistoric times, uh, the human race had, the, at least the Homo sapiens, had a number of threats. These were wild animals that were larger and faster, stronger. Uh, we also had the Neanderthals that were comparable to us in many ways, and we had to basically get them out of this planet. So how did we do this? We invented tools, mechanical hard tools, uh, with which we could fight and hunt. Uh, we started making fire, we invented agriculture. That gave us access to a lot more energy. And we did something very smart. Some of these wild animals that were threats to us, we domesticated. We also domesticated animals uh, for sources of energy, right? Now, how is this all useful if we consider threats that might be in the future? Well, we might draw some lessons. We might uh, summarize what we did as the Homo sapiens and try, try the same, see if it works. So being smart is very important. Of course, now it looks like artificial intelligence might be smarter than us. That would be a problem. Okay, we need to know the adversary. So if we just assume that artificial intelligence is something nebulous out there, there's not much we can say or do. Um, we are particularly interested in physical resources that we can control and that our adversaries can control, right? This has always been the case in the history. We found our way to beat such and such enemies by looking at physical resources. And uh, we always use the physical word world to our advantage. So my background is in hardware design, electronic hardware, and uh, thinking about physical world is pretty straightforward, but uh, to people who did software most of their uh, working lives, that may be an unusual step. So if you look at, uh, if you look even at science fiction, this idea of relying on the physical attributes or using some physical tricks is pretty clear. If you're fighting vampires, you would use silver bullets. If you need to turn off uh, a malicious uh, spaceship computer, you need to find the switch, right? Um, and if you are trying to kill a Terminator, uh, you better understand the anatomy of the Terminator, where to insert the explosives or where to shoot the bullets. So, um, let's see. Okay. How the dystopian AI myth, how would it be different from what we see from the history? As I mentioned, the possibility of AI becoming smarter than us would be new and unique. Because all the previous enemies we had, they were not smarter. And smarter doesn't mean smarter in everything. It means that this new AI could do something we would not understand. That would be already pretty bad. And of course, it would be malicious. Um, the physical embodiments, there could be a number of different cases. We might not see what's going on. We might not know what's going on, but the malicious AI might be still tied to the physical reality. So we definitely want to track the energy uh, that it uses and the, whatever the actuators or the influence on the physical world that it uses. Let me uh, maybe take a little detour if I can only get, yes, okay. So th this is an illustration that isn't really of an AI, but um, this is the most dramatic example in the history of the humankind that I could find uh, where we faced an existential threat. So in the 14th century, uh, the Black Death, which was a plague, uh, decimated 40% of the population of Europe. It appeared for no particular reason, in some places, in Italy, obviously, uh, maybe Greece, 
it was brought through trade from, by merchants, and people started dying. No one knew why, because you know the uh, the virus particles were very small, uh, and at that point the there were no microscopes, there, were, there was no notion of, of infectious diseases, um, there was no explanation. So uh, the disease spread through many, many years, killed a lot of people, and at the end, no one still understood what happened. This would be illustrative of what you might expect if um, a super intelligent AI would attack. You would not know precisely what's going on, you would see huge problems and you will be almost helpless. So what did people do in the 14th century? They noticed the spread of the disease uh, was very geographical. That was a very clear hint that there was some physical agent related to the disease. And eventually, they, they, they limited travel, they limited how people would you know, communicate with other people, and they introduced all sorts of things related to hygiene, right? So this was an example of using the physical world to fight an unknown, or maybe a threat that is known but not understood, and we should be ready to do something similar, right? So the bottom line here is that intelligence, hostile or friendly, would be limited by resources, by physical resources. And we need to think about physical resources if we want to limit such attacks. Uh, a different example of this is that when uh, the Go playing programs at Google started winning over uh, world's best players, that started happening a year ago, happened this year again, it turned out that Google um, used specialized chips in, in the computers that were playing um, to accelerate the computations. It tells you that even if you have a very strong um, algorithm, a very strong piece of software, you would still be limited by physical resources if you're pushing the limits. And uh, of course, a specialized chip requires very heavy development, very significant investment. So now back to um, the, the idea of looking at the physical world and uh, physical hardware. Uh, in the discipline of electronic hardware design, we use abstraction hierarchies. Uh, we go from transistors to CPUs to data centers. And each level typically has a well-defined function. So if you're looking at this from the perspective of security, if you're defending against something, you would want to limit or regulate every level, right? And you would want the same type of limitations for AI. Now, uh, this entire discussion, uh, at least in my head, started when uh, uh, ML Khan posted this question on Quora uh, about a year and a half ago. And so the question was basically specific about the constraints that you would put on AI to prevent uh, dystopian threats, right? So how would we approach this? We would uh, introduce hard boundaries between different levels of intelligence, right? Uh, you want to limit toasters and doorknobs. They shouldn't be too clever. They shouldn't have access to too many things. And, uh, you know, which of these levels are allowed to, for example, use weapons or, you know, control uh, electricity in your home? I wouldn't w want the annoying orange to, you know, shoot a gun or something. Um, but more generally, each agent, each part of your AI ecosystem needs to be designed with some weakness. You don't want um, agents to be able to take over everything, right? So you would control agents through these uh, weaknesses or through this, the separation of uh, powers. You definitely want to limit self-replication and self-repair of these systems. So the flag example illustrates that. And this would be harder to do in software, especially on a network, right? So, uh, of course, computer viruses il illustrate that kind of propagation, but we know a lot about computer viruses and how to limit their spread. Um, we need to control energy, and uh, this includes the electric grid, this includes food for us. Um, and it's probably important not to equip standalone AI agents with long-lasting sources of energy. So if you uh, think of, of the Iron Man and, and you know, the sources of energy there, that would be an example, right? Because if you want to disable um, such an agent, energy sources would be 
the first thought. Now, I listed four uh, constraints, but uh, there is also a, a trick that was very instrumental in, in the human evolution. Uh, we can use it again. So if you are worried about potential threats, then try to use some of them uh, for protection or try to you know, adapt, domesticate these threats. So you might use AI, you might develop you know, a friendly AI that would protect you from malicious AI or track uh, unauthorized accesses. Here's a summary of these constraints and, and, and the suggestion, the uh, domestication suggestion. So we, we do want hard boundaries between levels of intelligence and trust. We do want limits on self-replication, self-repair, and self-improvement. We absolutely need to uh, control access to energy sources of all kinds. And we need to be very careful about physical and network security of critical infrastructure because that's, you know, how does, if, if that is not taken care of, disasters can obviously happen. Now, with these rules, we should still um, be very clear about protection efforts that are focused on specific scenarios. Um, specific vulnerabilities that we know of, nuclear weapons, early warning systems that can trigger the use of nuclear weapons. We also need to be uh, clear about energy facilities, uh, hydroelectric dams, power stations, uh, large oil storage facilities. Um, we also know there are huge risks in mass transit where people travel in close spaces and are vulnerable. Uh, there also, there's potential for artificial diseases, which I don't think we understand very well. We know there are some infectious diseases, but what can be engineered, we don't really quite understand. But still, these are specific scenarios. And if we're afraid of um, AI that is smarter than us, uh, that AI may come up with something completely different. So we need abstract rules and constraints because uh, AI definitely will be applied in many ways. So we are not trying to capture every single application or scenario. Um, and in my opinion, if something actually happens, something that will be very undesirable, it will probably be, probably be a combination of some accidents and some independent efforts. It will not be planned, right? And so preventing these things or at least moderating can be done with rules and constraints that are to some extent abstract. Now, oops. Uh, can we get back to the last slide? So I, I made it look like um, I, I had all the answers, but I really don't. And the consideration that throws a wrench into uh, all these nice rules and constraints is the tech augmentation of, of humans. Namely, within, I don't know, 10, 15 years, we will probably start seeing people with uh, very serious enhancements. Perhaps memory, perhaps physical abilities, perhaps uh, they will need to sleep less. And so if you're trying to defend, uh, uh, if you're trying to defend someone from someone and there is no clear boundary between these different groups, uh, the entire rule-based system falls apart. So I am still trying to get the last slide, but uh, uh, basically I don't know what to do with this? It's, it's a completely different game where uh, you have tech augmented, perhaps human workers, perhaps designer people, designer babies, perhaps people improve themselves the way they uh, think they should be. Um, and that's, that's really a very tough question. So if any of you have good ideas, I'd be very interested. Thank you.